Awesome. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, I appreciate if you all didn't come to the webinars, we wouldn't be able to have them. So thank you, thank you. Uh, my name is Debbie Elder. I'm from Aurora Behavioral Hospitals. We have two hospitals here in Arizona where we treat adolescents and adults. Um, and we also treat special needs kids from eight to 17. We have so many awesome programs that we offer both inpatient and outpatient. Uh, we have horses that come every week and dogs and the food is amazing. If you live in Arizona or visit Arizona and would like to see the hospital, you are welcome to reach out to me and I would love to give you a tour. Uh, Katie's also on here. She's quiet because she's at a conference, but she's our director. And um, then today we actually are co-hosting this with our wonderful partners at Scottsdale Youth and Community Coalition. And I am now going to turn it over to your illustrious, amazing moderator and host, Rachel Rubenstein <laughs> from The Counseling Consultants. That was an amazing introduction. So my name's Rachel Rubenstein, and I'm from The Counseling Consultants. Uh, we see kids eight and older. We have offices in Scottsdale and Mesa. We accept insurance, and we'd love to help. Um, but today I'm representing the Scottsdale Youth and Community Coalition. And, and like Debbie said, we get to collaborate on these CEU mm -hmm. events quarterly. Um, Scottsdale Youth and Community Coalition is a professionals group for people who are working with kids and families who are dealing with mental health, substance use and eating disorders. We have monthly virtual meetings, and then we have two meetings per year in person. And I am so excited to get to moderate today. Um, I am going to now introduce our amazing speaker. And I'm going to say this from firsthand experience. Um, okay. Uh, are we missing something that's supposed to be shared? I'm looking at a, my screen. It looks funny. Nope. I just... Um, I turned mine off so that Eva can share hers. Oh, okay, wonderful. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm expressing my um, appreciation to Eva as a, someone who was a client, someone who has studied this with Eva. I was so impressed with it. Positive discipline is amazing. So Eva Dwight is a wife of 37 years mother of two fabulous young men, age 26 and 29, and a grandmother to Riley June, who was just born in September of last year. She's a former English language arts teacher of 12 years, a former junior high counselor of 20 years, bless her heart, and trainer for the Positive Dis Discipline Association, a member of the Positive Discipline Association Board of Directors, and co-chair of the Educators section of the North American Society of Adlerian Psychology, NASAP. Eva helps parents create loving, respectful relationships with their children. She teaches, um, she helps teachers create classrooms with a culture of respect and connection. And she has a vision of children who see themselves as capable, contributing and loving members of their family of parents who find joy in raising respectful, responsible, resilient children, of classrooms where teachers and students offer one another support and respect, turn conflict into an opportunity to problem solve and see themselves as contributing, thriving members of the school community. As a coach, facilitator and trainer, she puts all her energy into turning that vision into reality. And that is true. In her free time, she loves spending time with her family, exploring new restaurants with her husband, and baking and eating decadent desserts. Apparently, she makes a mean cheesecake. So please help me welcome Eva. Thank you. I'm so thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. And I, I'm always excited for the opportunity to, to share a positive discipline with people. So I see people are hear from a lot of different places, and I'm so glad you're with us today. Because of the webinar format, this will not be quite as interactive as um, normally uh, these trainings are, and yet I am going to ask for your um, for your involvement, and we'll use the chat as our main um, space for communication. <clears throat> but in addition to what Rachel just told you about me, I'll just tell you 
pretty quickly, um, I, I came to positive discipline because when my older son was two, my mom, who was a music teacher, had to, had to take a continuing education class and just happened to sign up for this class called Positive Discipline. And she brought me the original book that came with that training. And she said, this was the most amazing training I've ever had. I think since he's turning two, this will be really helpful to you. And I wish I had had this when you were growing up. And so when I read this book, this is the, the latest version of, I have to turn it funny for my mirroring here. Um, this is the latest edition. It's not my 27 year old book now, because um, that was 27 years ago. So um, this book, spoke to who I had become as a teacher. I'd been teaching for 10 years at that point, And it really spoke to who I wanted to be as a parent, who my husband wanted to be as a parent. So our children are now 29 and 26. And so Jeremiah was two when we first read the book. So I've been a positive disciplined parent for 27 years. It does not make anybody a, a perfect parent. There is no such thing. It does not make our children, perfect children. There is no such thing. We're all human beings walking in the world together. What it gives us <clears throat> is tools for developing respectful relationships with each other, within our family, within the classroom. Um, and so when we do make mistakes, when our kids do misbehave, when I misbehave, when I forget to use my tools and skills, what we have are tools for repairing that relationship and moving forward with a better plan. And so uh, my husband and I can speak to this after so many years. It has not just enhanced our relationship with our kids. It's enhanced our relationship with each other and our individual relationship within ourselves. So this is deep work. I'm going to give you a snapshot of several different activities this morning, and you'll have an opportunity to um, experience some of what we do with positive discipline, and then I'll give you some information toward the end about how you can learn more if that's something that's of interest to you. So with, with that, I'm gonna screen share and just let you know that my goals for our learning today are to grow your awareness of Adlerian and positive discipline principles, <clears throat> to help you learn some effective strategies to share with parents for increasing cooperation and connection, and to explore a framework for helping parents recognize a child's belief behind the behavior so that they can be more strategic in their response to the child rather than reacting to the behavior. So that's what I really emphasize, respond to the child rather than reacting to the behavior. And I have some handouts that I'm gonna share with you Pretty soon, I'll put those in the chat. In fact, I'm going to put I'm going to put this one in the chat now, just so you'll have it. Let me find that on my computer. Oh, Debbie, it's not letting me share from my computer. Are you, Debbie? I sent you that mistaken goals handout. Are you able to put that in the chat? I can do that. I'll look for it. Okay, thank you. It's the the PDF of the mistaken goals, and you can just put it in. And Debbie, if there's anything we need to fix to allow me to be able to add things from my computer, that would be helpful. But if not, if if one of you could load it, that would be great. I will look in change of setting. Okay, thanks. Okay, so we'll move forward while they're working on that. You won't need that handout for a few minutes anyway, so totally fine. Um, need to move things around. I have my chat open so I can see it. So one thing I really want you to, to understand is that when we do training in positive discipline, everything is very experiential. So I'm going to talk a lot more in this webinar format than I normally do. But the reason we do a lot of role-playing and discussion-based learning is because that's the most effective way to help people get a glimpse into the thinking and feeling and decision process of their kids, as well as our own as adults, our own thinking, feeling and deciding process. So we're reaching the heart and we're reaching the heart and we're reaching the head. Um, and Alfred Adler, I'm gonna tell you more about him in a few minutes, said that life happens at the level of events, not words. So um, a lot of what we do in our trainings is to give people experiences that then they can process and learn from and take that learning forward into their lives. So the foundation of the, the, 
the processing that we do with participants is based on this concept that Alfred Adler referred to as private logic. The idea that people are always making decisions about what they need to do in order to thrive or survive. And it starts over here with perception. We have an experience and we have perceptions around that experience. We interpret, we create beliefs, we think, you know, what is this person saying? What is that person doing? Oh, I noticed this. I'm perceiving all this. I'm perceiving my own response to the experience. Those interpretations, beliefs, and thoughts generate feelings. And based on those thoughts and feelings, we make decisions, sometimes very consciously, but sometimes at an unconscious level too, right? And so when we decide that decision-making process has kind of a, a twofold aspect to it. It could be, what are you deciding about yourself or the other person? I am someone who what? They are someone who what? And it's also about what are you deciding to do? And so after we do activities, you'll notice that thinking, feeling, and deciding is what I'm going to ask you to process each time. And I'm going to start with an activity. And I'm not going to share my screen for this because I don't necessarily want you to see what it is that I'm looking at on my screen. But what I would like you all to do, and I think for the purposes of, of our work together today, I'm going to um, ask you to pretend like you're a teenager, somewhere between the ages of, of 13 and, and 19, you pick. Um, this work is completely applicable to children of all ages. And I say that, honestly, for, for younger children, for older children, and for young adults, um, if you're the parent of young adults, if I if I forget to use my skills with my grown sons, I know pretty quickly, oh, I wasn't using my skills. So this is applicable throughout the lifespan. What I would like you to do is pretend that you're a teen and I'm going to be your parent. And I want you to notice as I give you some feedback, what are you thinking? What are you feeling? What are you deciding? And then I'll ask you to give me some responses in the chat. Stop arguing with your brother. Set the table so we can eat. Go do your homework or you won't be able to go to the party. Remember to put on your coat, it's cold out. Chores first, then TV, you know that. And so Rachel, I started that activity without making you my timer. Could you set your timer for, let me see. Why don't you give me 10 minutes and let me know when I have two minutes left. Gotcha. Okay, thanks. It help me, helps me keep on time if I have a, a timer here. So I would like those of you who are, are here, if you're able to write in the chat, would you notice as the child that you're thinking and feeling when I was telling you all those things? Do this, do that. Yeah, I see lots of, stop telling me what to do. Why are you telling me? Oh, she's angry with me. There are these coming fast. Um, it's not that important, or you feel like you're accused. Um, stop preaching at me. Okay, I notice those thoughts and feelings. And so I might ask you, and you can just do that work here in your own head. What have you decided about yourself or about me, the parent? I am... Mom is. Oh, mom is annoying. I am worthless. I'm never good enough. Yeah. So notice those thoughts and feelings and decisions that are happening there. And so I'm going to go to a list that we meet that we, that we make at the beginning of each training, and I'll talk more about this pretty soon. At the beginning of every workshop or training, we start by asking parents for a list of challenging behaviors that they experience from their kids. And then we ask them to envision their child walking out into the world as a young adult. What life skills and character traits do you want to grow in your child over time? Because these are skills for thriving in the world. And so right now, kids, I want you to think about, hmm, 
Are there any challenging behaviors you're likely to engage in after you've been told, 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 told what to do? And you don't have to write that in the chat. You can just think. Hmm. And then I wonder if I was giving you any opportunities to practice any of these skills. Maybe not. That's typically the reaction. So I want to stop sharing again. I want to do something different. I want you to be the same child, same age you decided to be. And this time I'm going to be different. And I want you to know, I want you to think about what are you thinking? What are you feeling? What are you deciding? Remember the original one you were fighting with your sibling? How can the two of you work this out? It's almost time for dinner. Do you want to set the table or chop up the salad? What's your plan for getting your work done before the party starts? It's pretty chilly out. Are you going to want your coat? What was our agreement about chores and TV? So what might be different? I see you putting in the chat. Thank you. What are you thinking, feeling? I see my voice matters. I'm being respected as a person. I feel included. There's some accountability there, giving choices. Oh, I get to participate in this exchange of information. I'm able to come up with solutions. So what are you deciding about yourself or about me? I'm someone who what? I'm important. I matter. I'm capable. I feel more powerful. Okay. My mom is someone who... I say collaborator, I'm part of this family, I can do it. Mom is someone who respects me, who cares, okay. And so I'm gonna share so that you can see my asking statements really quick. So I'm asking you how you can work out a problem. I'm asking you to contribute to dinner preparation, planning for your, your work to get done, deciding whether you need an article of clothing, reflecting on an agreement, I wonder what life skills and character traits you're getting an opportunity to practice. And I will ask if some people can add those to the chat. What are some skills that you see there? I see planning, decision-making, problem solving. Yeah. Communication skills. Integrity, what was, you know, what was our agreement? Following through, self-sufficiency, responsibility, empathy, a lot, right? And all I did was make one shift in my communication style. And so I would ask you to consider, think about all the times that parents or you, if you work, if you have children, might tell a child or another person in your life, if you if you don't have children, think about, mm, who else is in my life? Do I do a lot of telling? And I would like you to put a telling statement. Let's focus on kids. What are some things that we tell kids of any age or teens in particular, what to do? What do you think kids hear from parents? Do your chores, clean up, do your homework. Don't, oh, there's a don't, don't do that. Stop doing that. Pick up your clothes. It's time for bed. Clean your room. And so kids spend their morning hearing us say, do this, do that. And then they go to school and they hear other adults in their lives saying, do this, do that, do this, don't do that all day long. And then they come home and we do more doing and don'ting telling, wow, after a full day of that, maybe multiple days of that, maybe that's your life. What might it be like for a kid in their long-term big picture decision-making process? Or how might they behave 
toward the adults. It's kind of mind numbing, right? Commands all day long make me want to disconnect. Okay, there's an adult response. Yeah, lack of autonomy, lack of trust of self, feeling disrespected. And so tuning out, thank you, Sarita. Is it any wonder that adults complain that our kids never listen to us? <laughs> so I wonder if you might've noticed in my telling statements in the first role play, Maybe a lot of it was going in one ear and right out the next, and you were going to be tuning me out. Whereas, what did you notice your response was to the asking? Did anybody notice some frontal lobe activity? Like you almost wanted to respond to my question. When we're, when we're doing this and we have more interaction possible, most people will say, oh, I, I, I thought about how I was going to respond. So there's an immediate shift that we're moving toward the executive functioning system instead of pff, tuning out. So I would like you to pick one of the statements that is in the chat. You can pick one that you wrote or one that somebody else wrote. And I would like you to instead say, hmm, what would be the asking instead? And let's write some questions. Can you tell me more about that? Which chore would you like to do first? There's a choice. Would you please put away your dishes? So that's kind of a telling, couched as a question. So we wanna watch for that. I see, do you wanna to go to bed now or in five minutes? More choices. How would you like to tackle this test, task? Or would you like to do your homework before or after dinner? What's your plan? Can you share? Yeah. So I would ask you to consider, hmm, am I an asker or a teller? And you know, we can do this stuff with our spouses, with our coworkers, with our bosses, and we can do this with, with other people in our lives. So you might just consider, hmm, am I more of an asker or am I more of a teller? Um, we typically will do more asking with adults than we do with kids. And so I wonder, now, are there times to be directive and do some telling? Absolutely, right? No tool is, is applicable to every situation. There are times when it's just really appropriate to say, hey, I need you to get this and we need to be out the door. Time's, time's running out. So Rachel, I'm down to two. Thank you. I'm sorry? You're at 10 minutes. Oh, I'm at 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll stop, but I want to take one minute for um, awareness. And if you're willing to put it in the chat, that's awesome. That's awesome. And if you just want to think it to yourself, you can. But what new awareness are you experiencing just from this short activity? I see in the chat, we often don't think kids have authority or experience to do things correctly. Yeah. <laughs> Rachel, I'm bossy. I know we can all be, right? And we're not, we have good intentions. We're just not aware of how our good intentions are landing on our kids. So that's an important awareness. I see respect is for all ages. Um, speaking to our kids the way we'd like to have them respond to us, yeah. Yeah, just being, thanks Alicia, more, just being more mindful of the approach and the words used. And so there are lots of tools that we can use to get a better result from the people that we're communicating with, whether they're our kids or our spouses or whoever, um, just being more intentional about which tool you're using and when and why um, can be helpful. And we can't be mindful of that every single minute of the day. Again, this is not designed to try to make you perfect. It's just designed to bring forward awareness so that you can decide where you might want to make a shift. Yeah. Thank you, Sarita. This is a really important awareness there. I'm contributing to my child's response. How do we invite responses from kids with our well-intentioned behavior and words, okay? So um, let's see, Rachel, would you give me 10 minutes? Tell me when I have two left. Right now I'm right on my time, so I appreciate that. Um, I would like to just share some basics about positive discipline with you. Um, these two lists that we make, um, typically I'll, I'll set them up 
and then put this in the middle. That positive discipline is the bridge to help us get from these challenging behaviors to these life skills and character traits. And this is actually a tool we can use. You can make one of these yourselves um, and use them at home, post it somewhere that it's handy and say, okay, I'm experiencing a child who's not listening. He doesn't seem to respond or she doesn't seem to respond to anything I say. And, and like, I have to say it three or four times. What's going on there? Hmm. What's the skill gap? I need my child to improve their communication skills. And that means listening is part of that. I think I might just add that because I don't think I have it on here. Um, I need them to develop listening skills and um, respect for self and others because it doesn't feel respectful when they ignore me. Um, I want them to develop self-sufficiency because really what I'm talking about may have something to do with, with things they need to be independent about. So I can take what's giving me trouble and figure out what's my goal and how can I take this moment as an opportunity to baby step my child toward those skills. And for me, what this does is it helps me take the emotion out of it. I'm not going to do brain in the palm of the hand, but if you're familiar with Dr. Dan Siegel's brain in the palm of the hand model and the flipped lid, I'll do it really quick. Brainstem, limbic system, executive functioning system. And when we're stressed and upset, we flip our lids and we're really getting all of our blood and oxygen flow to the emotional place and the fight or flight place. So when I'm feeling upset by my children's behavior, my lid is probably flipped and I'm not in a place to use my executive functioning skills. So I need to take the emotion out of it, get my lid down and say, okay, how can I turn this into a teachable moment? And that's where this tool can be really, really helpful. Just a quick history on positive discipline. If you're familiar with Alfred Adler and Rudolf Dreikers, Alfred Adler was um, a psychologist and a medical doctor early in the 20th century. And he was interacting with people like Fre uh, Freud and Jung and some others um, when psychology was so new. And a lot of the emphasis on um, some of these, these psychologists that you might have heard of more is that the primary motivation for behavior, for human behavior, is to seek reward and avoid punishment. And Adler said, it goes deeper than this. And I'm gonna talk about this more in a minute. It's about the human need for a feeling of belonging and significance. And so when I feel like I belong to the group, I matter to the group. I'm important there. I'm loved, I'm liked. And when I feel a sense of significance, when I have something to contribute to the group, my contribution is respected and appreciated, then I'm likely to use behaviors that are what Adler would call socially useful. They're useful to me in the moment and my big picture, and they're useful to the group, whether it's the family group, the classroom group, the church group, the peer group. And when I don't feel a sense of belonging, when I don't feel important to the group, I am likely to revert to what we would just call misbehavior in an effort to get that feeling of belonging and significance back. It's often a misguided attempt, and that's why it's misbehavior. Adler would call it socially useless. It's not useful to me. It's not useful to the group. And so that's a primary difference between him and, and what we might call behavioral approaches to behavior. And Rudolf Dreikers was first his student and then his colleague, and then he really moved the work forward, especially into the classroom. Um, the Journal of Individual Psychology, um, last summer's edition, this is an Adlerian focused um, peer reviewed journal. And so uh, the last summer edition focused primarily on positive discipline research. Um, Jane Nelson wrote the original book in about 1980. She was a school counselor at the time working on her PhD. She couldn't find a publisher for the book, so she self-published and it just took off. And she met Lynn Lott, who was an Adlerian therapist through NASAP, the North American Society for Ad, um, Adlerian Psychologists. And they teamed up and worked together to create the programming for teachers and the programming for parents. And there are additional programs for now working with couples and working with respectful relationships in the workplace. So um, those ladies are in their 80s and they are amazing women. Lynn is retired. Jane is still um, a member actively of the board and comes to every conference, every think tank, um, still is cr uh, creating activities. She's very highly engaged, just truly who I wanna be when I grow up. <laughs> so just a few positive discipline principles. We practice authoritative uh, parenting and teaching, not controlling or authoritarian. 
and not permissive. We're walking that line of kind and firm at the same time. So helping children feel a sense of belonging and significance. And again, the belonging is about the love and connection. The significance is about responsibility and contribution. So how can we be too kind or too firm? Boy, that people know how to do one or they know the other, but they don't know how to do both at the same time. So we really help people understand what does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like when someone is being kind and firm with us, with the role play, like the one we just did? Um, behavior is goal oriented. We're going to look at that today. The idea of mutual dignity and respect between adults and children. Somebody noticed in the chat that we treat adults with more respect than we do children. And that's partly because that's what we've been taught, taught to do in our society. We, we are raised in what we call a vertical relationship where adults believe that, child, you have to show me respect no matter what, because I'm the adult. But child, I don't have to treat you with respect. You have to earn it first. And so coming from a, a place of verticality means that we have oftentimes disrespected children and taken away their dignity. And so what we wanna do is come from a horizontal place. That means we recognize the child's um, innate deserving of respect and dignity. And so it's not about never having power like, Parents or teachers often say, well, that means we all have equal power. Well, no, not really, because in order to raise our children who don't have executive functioning systems that are fully developed, um, in order to help them grow and develop, yes, there needs to be some power over in some aspects, but always with an eye for maintaining that sense of dignity and respect. And so um, I like to think of it as um, setting boundaries and expectations and within those boundaries and expectations, our kids have freedom to explore, to try new things, to make mistakes and make repair um, and learn and grow. Encouragement is the greatest motivator. We're going to talk more about that later. Um, the idea of community and social interest. So again, Adler was looking at how we can help human beings, children as they're growing up, understand their contribution to the group. Because um, when, the, when the individual is thriving, and the group is thriving, then our whole society is thriving. Um, we are solution focused rather than punishment and reward focused. Again, more on that pretty soon. And mistakes are opportunities to learn for us and for our kids. And I don't know about you, but I was raised to believe that mistakes are opportunities to hide and hope that nobody notices, to make excuses or deflect or blame. I wouldn't have made that mistake if, if you hadn't or they hadn't or this hadn't. <laughs> And why do we do that? Because, thanks Rachel, because we're afraid of how the others are going to respond. So if we can help children see that mistakes are opportunities to learn and how do we move forward from that? That's a primary goal and it helps us develop a trusting relationship with them. So five criteria for effective discipline is that it helps children feel a sense of connection. It's mutually respectful and encouraging. It's effective long-term and it teaches important social and life skills like we saw in our two lists and invites children to discover just how capable they really are. So Rachel or Debbie, were we able to get the, um, I'm, I still can't share from my computer, darn. Um, are you able to load, is one of you able to load something I am not able to load okay. the Okay. I changed the setting, but apparently the wrong one. Um, so Debbie, do you, you want me, something? I'm going to try uh, which one of the, or do you want me to load all of those four worksheets or? I would I would like the four mistaken goals right now. Four and mistaken. then the others can come later. Okay. I will try to get that up there. It's called mistaken goals and it's a PDF. Yep, got it. Okay, I will oh, give that a shot here. Yeehaw. The good news is I retyped it and fit it into my PowerPoint, but I always think it's helpful when people can look at their own copy. So I'm going to let Debbie play with that while I keep talking. And Rachel, for this activity, 
I would like to have 20 minutes. And so I want to talk a little bit about that Adlerian and positive discipline principle of behavior being goal oriented. What does that mean? If we think of it in terms of an iceberg, so like the tip of the iceberg pokes out from the water and we know that that's the smallest part of the iceberg. And so the behaviors that we can see and hear are the child's response to a problem that we don't see because it's beneath the surface. There's a belief behind the behavior. What is that child thinking, feeling, and deciding that's motivating the behavior? There's that need for belonging and significance, which can be broken into four sub-goals of the need for appropriate attention, a need for power and autonomy, a need for fairness and justice, and a need for the sense of capability. And so when these needs are not getting met, kids and human beings in general, will revert to behaviors that are unconsciously designed to help them feel what they're missing and experience that instead. So I want to start um, with what is actually the second one on the chart. And, and if you guys don't get the chart now, we'll, we'll send it out to you afterwards. So no worries. Um, I want you to think about, and you can Think of this depending on who you work with. If you work with teens, think about teens' behaviors. If you work with younger children or you have younger children, think in terms of your child. That's totally fine because this is the same no matter what. But think about behaviors that cause parents to feel angry, challenged, threatened. And, and I, I don't necessarily mean physically threatened, although that could be present in some situations. I mean more that they're feeling like their power has been threatened, right? Um, like I'm in a power struggle, or maybe I feel defeated because I, I, I know I've lost this battle. Maybe I've lost the war. So I wonder if you could put some behaviors in the chat that might make parents feel angry, challenged, threatened, or defeated. Yeah, back talk. Yelling, lying, ignoring, storming. Yeah. Mm, threatening, yeah, they're threatening to call 911 or CPS or whatever, right? There's a lot of things. So what can we do to help us understand what's motivating that behavior? There is a, a chart called the mistaken goals and um, and Dreikers and Adler referred these to these as mistaken goals because the goal is to seek belonging and significance. And it's a mistaken way of trying to achieve that. So what we can do is we can tune into our own feelings to give us a clue as to what might be the child's motivation. And so if the child, if the parent or the teacher feels angry, challenged, threatened, or defeated, and tends to react by fighting, giving in, thinking you can't get away with this or I'm going to make you, or they just want to be right. Anybody ever felt like that? I felt like that as a parent, okay? And so that's the parent's reaction. And if the child's response is they intensify the behavior or they comply, but with defiance, you know how they can do that with the attitude and the body language, um, or they feel like they've won when the parent or teacher is upset, even if they have to comply, I pushed your buttons. <laughs> um, or they give you passive power. They say, yes, oh, I'll do it. And then they don't follow through. The belief behind the child's behavior is likely, I belong only when I'm the boss, when I'm in control, or when I'm proving no one can boss me. You can't make me. And so this is a child's goal is mis misguided, misguided power to be the boss. And we adults can inadvertently contribute to this by thinking I'm in control and you have to do what I say, or I believe that telling you what to do and lecturing or punishing you when you don't do it is the best way to motivate you to feel better, to do better. Jane Nelson has this great quote. Um, where did we ever get the crazy idea that in order to get a child to do better, first we need to make them feel worse. Children do better when they feel better and so do adults. And it's not about making them feel good or happy all the time, but it's about helping them feel a sense of belonging and significance, right? 
And so the last column gives us some choices. So I'm gonna read through these and I want you to see if you can think of a particular child who might be making you feel this way or a hypothetical child who has done one of those behaviors you had put in the chat. Things that a parent can do or a teacher in the classroom, redirect to positive power by asking for help. I know I can't make you, but I really need your help. <laughs> or I actually, I know I can't make you and I really need your help. Offer limited choices. Do you wanna do this first or that first? These two things have to be done. You choose which to do first, I don't care. Or these things need to get done. Do you wanna do this one and I'll do that one? You pick, because choice is power. And child says, or teen says, well, I don't want that one, I want this one. Well, sometimes there are times to say, oh, okay, well, that's a possibility, let's try that. And there are other times to say, you know, right now, these are your two choices. We can talk about that one later, but right now I need you to choose this, one or the other. Um, but I promise we'll talk about that other choice because that's interesting. So if, if we let them know, there are possibilities. Don't fight and don't give in. Withdraw from the conflict. My lid is flipped. This is not a good time for me to be talking about this problem. I'm going to go take some time out and get my lid down. I wonder if you want to also. How can we re-regulate and then come back and talk about it? Um, be firm and kind. Don't talk. Act. Decide what you will do. And the other half of that is usually decide what you will do and follow through. You can turn off the video game yourself and have an opportunity to play tomorrow. If you continue to play, I will need to turn it off and then I'll put it in my closet for 24 hours. And then we need to talk about how we're gonna handle this differently next time. So here's what I will do. I'm just letting you know. If you abuse the privilege of driving, I will not let you borrow my car. Um, if you know, I get to decide because I can't control you. I can control me. And so if this is the behavior you're going to use, then here's how I'm going to respond. If you speak to me disrespectfully, I'm going to let you know it sounds disrespectful. And if you continue to do it, I'm going to leave the room. And I'd be glad to talk to you when you can change your tone of voice. Um, let routines be the boss. Um, people are really good at setting up routine charts for their little kids, but they think by the time kids are teenagers, they don't need those. Routine charts are really, really helpful. What's our plan? What's our how the week is going? What's the chores you've agreed to do? When are they going to get done? Let's put that plan together. And then we can say, hey, what was like I did in the role play? What was our agreement? Um, leave and calm down. Develop mutual respect. Um, set a few reasonable limits. Practice follow through. And use family or class meetings if you're in the classroom. Use family meetings at home to talk about. We seem to be having a problem with this. I wonder how we could work this out. Let's brainstorm some possibilities. So I want to take um, just a minute. I'm going to stop sharing. So I, well, I, I can still see. Thoughts or questions around this, and then I want to talk about the other mistaken goals, because I know we haven't been able to load that yet, so you might not be able to see it. But just responses to this process. What awareness do you have or questions? I have a question for you. Okay. Could you talk a little bit more about what you said at the beginning about responding to the child and not the behavior? That's so interesting. Yeah. And so... When I can think of my child's behaviors in this in these terms, okay, here's the behavior I'm getting. Something's causing it. I don't know what it is. Or maybe I have an inkling of what it is, and I can ask. You know, I I think that we might be in a power struggle. And I use this with my my younger child has been about power ever since he was 10 months old and could get off my lap and walk away. <laughs> from me when he didn't like what I was doing, right? He's he's always needed um, to really feel powerful. So how my big task as a parent was, how do I help him feel power in positive ways so he doesn't take it in negative ways? Um, and so I can ask, you know, Nathan, I, I think I stepped on your power. Are, are you feeling like I'm trying to control you right now? I wonder if that's what's happening. And I don't know, I'm just asking. And so you can you can ask kids for what we call goal disclosure and just couch it in those terms. I wonder if this is what's going on for you. And if they say no, well, I wonder if you could help me understand. So we have to connect before we can correct. 
And so when I don't have connection, I get resistance. So this is really hard for parents often to take that moment and say, what's going on? How can I connect with you so that we can work out this problem? And, and power frequently needs those kinds of discussions and solutions that we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. Does that make sense? So I'm going to respond to my child as a person rather than just reacting to the behavior in a way that my uh, brainstem might be in fight or flight mode. And so then I turn into this parent and, and boundary, boundary, boundary parent. And, and because I'm reacting to the sense of being challenged or threatened at a really basic level. Does that make sense? Yes, it's so helpful. And it's helpful with adults too. Absolutely. I have a question for you. Um, a teenager who is already doing what they want and parents are struggling to change the behavior, child is passively agreeing, but doing what they want anyhow. How mm -hmm. do you work with them to give them power when they don't feel they need it? Don't, okay. they don't feel the need to have They're it. already taking it all, it sounds like, right? So the, the child has put themselves here over the parent, it sounds like. I'm going to ask you to hold that thought because we are going to look at some other possibilities there and we're going to do an activity. The last activity I do, I think will give some possibilities here. Oh, 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 I love you, Debbie. She got the mistaken gold chart in the chat. So if you can open that, you'll see this whole thing. And what other ones did you want me to share from before? I don't know why this was. So um, you can go ahead and put in. Um, you know what? I'm going to ask you to do it toward the end. Would that be OK? Oh, so perfect. Yeah. Back? Okay, perfect. So I think I have about six or eight minutes left and I want to look at the other three mistaken goals. So again, we're going to tune into, let me see, where am I? We're going to tune into our feelings. So now if you've got the chart downloaded, I'm on the top column. Um, a child's behaviors that cause parents to feel or teachers annoyed, irritated, worried, or guilty. And annoyed and irritated are pretty self-evident. The worried is often about, um, I'm worried that you always seem to need so much attention and are you ever going to learn this skill? Am I is it ever going to work out? I feel guilty because I'm not giving you what you need. I don't know how else to do it. It's that kind of worry guilt. Um, and so if we look at our chart, we can see if the parent or teacher feels annoyed, irritated, worried, or guilty and tend to react by reminding, coaxing, doing things for the child that they could do for themselves, and if the child's behavior stops temporarily, but later resumes the same or another disturbing behavior, it's likely that the child's belief is, I count or belong only when I'm being noticed or getting special service. I'm only important when I'm keeping you busy with me. And how might adults contribute? We might contribute by thinking, I don't have faith in you to deal with disappointment. I have to pay attention to you all the time. I feel guilty if you aren't happy. And so it's likely that the child's mistaken goal, number column one here, is a need for undue attention to keep others busy or to get special service. Eva, and can I, may I interrupt you just for a minute? There's a number of people who are saying they're not able to see the chart. I'm not sure why. Okay. Um, and we will make sure that we email that in case in case you weren't able to grab it. Sorry Here's, about that. It's I don't know. I can see it. Yeah, I I, to host and panelists. Oh, I, I sent it again to everybody. I posted yeah. it the second time to everybody. Oh, so if you scroll up a little bit from where the chat is right now, oh, folks, okay. you'll be able to see mistaken goal chart PDF and you can double click on it and download it. And if not, we're going to email it to you after the, the presentation. So you will awesome. get it. People said they're able to open it. So awesome. awesome. Okay. So I'm not going to go through all of the proactive and encouraging responses for this one. But I just want you to be aware that sometimes the goal is a need for undue attention. If the child's behaviors cause the parent to feel hurt, disappointed, disbelieving, disgusted, like, I can't believe you would say that to me. After all I do for you, I, I raised you better than that. Those kinds of feelings. Then it's likely that we might react by hurting back, by shaming, I raised you better than that. You can't, uh, thinking, how could you do such a thing? And then if the child's response is they retaliate, the behavior intensifies, or they escalate the same behavior or choose another weapon, so to speak, it's likely that their belief is, I don't think I belong, so I will hurt others as I feel hurt. 
And we've all heard that phrase, hurt people, hurt people. This is a person who's in a place of revenge. They're feeling like something is unjust or unfair, or they just feel like nobody cares about them. I can't be liked or loved. We can contribute to this by giving advice without listening, because I think I'm helping. I'm just going to try to tell you what I think you should do <laughs> without asking what you, what you need. Or I expect you to know why I focus more on your grades than I focus on you as a person, for example. Um, the child's goal is a need for revenge to get even. And the coded message is, I'm hurting. Validate my feelings. And so sometimes somebody else has hurt that child, but they don't feel capable of responding to that person, whether it's a, a, a powerful person at school, a teacher, another kid, whatever. And so, and you've probably had the days like that, right? Where you just feel like, you know, the whole world's coming down on you and it has nothing to do with your family, but you come home and you're exploding at your family because they're the safe target. Kids will do that too. And so when we're feeling hurt, disappointed, disbelieving, or disgusted, this is a really important time to say, hey, it seems like your feelings are hurt. Did I did I hurt your feelings in some way? I did not mean to, or I shouldn't have said that. And I think it was hurtful. I apologize. We need to, again, create the connection so that we can figure out what's going on here and how do we make it right. And then finally, I really want to pay attention to this last one because I think it's one of the hardest ones to deal with. When we feel despair, hopeless, helpless, inadequate. I don't know what to do. I'll give up. I'm so inadequate as a parent. I cannot help you move forward. This is a child <clears throat> who demonstrates behaviors of giving up, doing, um, I'm sorry, this is how we tend to react when we're in that place. We tend to either give up and let them go do whatever, or we do things for them that they could do for themselves. We overhelp. And if they retreat further, if they become more passive, if they show no improvement, if they're just not responding, it's likely that their belief is, I can't belong because I'm not perfect, so I'll convince others not to expect anything of me. I'm helpless and unable. It's no use trying because I won't do it right. We inadvertently contribute by maybe thinking, I expect you to live up to my high expectations, and we're not aware of how overwhelming that is for our kids. Or I thought it was my job to do things for you. So I've done, 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 and now you don't feel capable. <laughs> so the child's mistaken goal is a place of assumed inadequacy, to give up and be left alone. However, the coded message is, don't give up on me. Show me a small step. So here are some things that we can do to help this child that's stuck in this very deep place. And often what happens is, that this behavior can mask as a need for power. And that shows up a lot with really determined refusal to try. I am not doing that. And a lot of the time, that's because they are so uncomfortable with feeling incapable. They don't want anybody else to know they feel incapable. So this, this power play is a way of deflecting from how incapable they feel. So we see that in the classroom a lot with kids who are the class clown or kids who are defiant and get into trouble or refuse to whatever, um, because they are not about to let anybody know that they don't think they can do this, whatever it is you're asking of me. So I, I really encourage parents and teachers to, when it feels like power, and you're trying some of those power strategies to encourage the child and help them make movement, but you're getting stuck go to assumed inadequacy, because it's possible that that's really what's going on. And I, I think I'm probably out of time on this activity, but I, and I, again, I, I know this is really deep work and I'm giving you a snapshot. Um, so I want to notice that there isn't always a mistaken goal. Sometimes kids are hungry or tired, low blood sugar, whatever. And especially with little ones, they could be being completely developmentally appropriate. I, I bite or I hit or I kick or whatever because I don't have any other tools. That's all I know. Um, and I also know that mental illness can influence thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. This, this private logic pattern can really be impacted by somebody's depression, their anxiety, whatever else might be happening for them. And yet, 
The need for belonging and significance is always there for all of us. And we can look at the need for attention, power, <clears throat> fairness and justice, and a sense of feeling capable. When we have all these in place, we're pretty much thriving. So how do these needs show up in how the child is presenting behavior or symptoms? So if we can help parents be aware that the behavior points to a need, try to figure out what the need is and respond to the need rather than reacting to the behavior. We're gonna focus on belief management rather than behavior management, if that makes sense. So I'm gonna give you like 60 seconds just to ponder that, pop an awareness or a question in the chat. I wanna do one more activity with you and then I'll take questions at the end for more of that too. <clears throat> Well, I'll, I'll jump in. I think it's interesting to bring our own self-awareness to our own behaviors and how they are interacting with our kids. Mm -hmm. And we're not perfect, right? We're going to mess up sometimes. So are our kids. Someone said, I love belief management. Mm. So Rachel, would you give me one more section of 15 minutes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see that comment, Margaret. Thank you. I need to be seeing things from my son's side before speaking. Yeah, it, it takes more. Yes, perfect for marriage too. Absolutely. And oh, I won't go in there. Anyway, um, I was going to say something there about the, the looking, thinking before speaking. You know, we don't always have to respond right away. It's okay to say, okay, I, I need a few minutes to process this and then I'll be back. And then let's talk about it again when lids are down. Um, so I want to ask again for you all to, to think in terms of being a child, but I'm going to ask also for your contribution as adults here. Okay. So first I'm gonna let you know that I have this problem that my child, let's call him a teenager, isn't dressed and ready to go when it's time to leave in the morning. They're late to school every day. I'm late to work. I'm just up to here with it. I don't have positive discipline skills, never heard of it. I'm a typical traditional parent. I need to know what can I do to my kid to make them get ready on time? And I'm gonna ask for your suggestions in the chat. So I want you to read my body language and my tone of voice. I want you to be in this place as a parent and you have no positive discipline skills at all. What I what do we do to this kid to get them to be on time? And I think we'll we'll keep our list in the chat. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to put um, to everyone. I'm going to put that question. What can I do to my kid to make them be on time? And yes, this webinar will be shared. It is recording. Um, oh, Samantha, we don't have school skills like that. We are traditional parents. Okay, we are going to threaten them. We're going to take things away. We're going to make them anxious to motivate them. Oh, you're going to get in trouble. This is going to ruin your life. You know, if you have too many tardies, they're going to deny you credit. You won't graduate this class. And then you're going to not graduate. And you're going to have to take summer school. Um, we can give them the silent treatment and we can start dressing them. We can yell that I am taking you to school in your PJs if you are not ready in five minutes. We can give them a guilt trip. How You know how much trouble I'm getting in because of you at work. I am going to lose my job if you aren't on time. You just need to get it together. So everybody look at those behaviors that we're going to do to our kids in the chat. There are a few positive discipline behaviors. Ignore those for now. And now I want you to put to, to put yourself in the place of the teen. I have threatened you. I've threatened to leave you. I've done a guilt trip on you. I've threatened to take away your gaming system. Probably I took away your phone. Um, I told you how you're ruining my day. All of those things. When you <clears throat> think about being with me as a parent, what are you thinking, feeling, and deciding as the kid? Exhausted, powerless, I don't matter. 
I wish you weren't my parent. I want to get away. You don't understand. <clears throat> yeah, this stinks. You're just numb after a while. And then I would ask you to reflect. And if I'm engaging in these types of behaviors in order to try to make you be on time. What are some challenging behaviors, maybe in addition to being late, that you might choose to engage in? Refusing to go, you might go get high, substance abuse, defiance. More disrespect, maybe ignoring me. If I ignore her long enough, maybe she'll go away. And am I giving you opportunities to practice these life skills and character traits? That's kind of a rhetorical question, okay? Yeah. So here's what I would like to try differently. This time, let's see. We're gonna shift the question. This time, I went to a positive discipline training and I've learned to look at this from a different perspective. So the new perspective is, I'll put this question in the chat. How can I help my child develop skills for being ready on time? Now, those of you who are putting some possible solutions, I would like to hear your ideas for that. And I would like some of you, if you're willing, to be in the teen's place and say, okay, so teenager, we just really need to work this out. I'm late all the time. You're late all the time. It's causing us to be so angry in the morning. And I feel yucky when I leave you at school and we're mad at each other. And I've been, I don't like that. It makes me feel horrible. I would really like morning to be a smooth experience and, and enjoy our ride to school. And, and I would like to leave you with a smile and a hug. I don't know how to solve this problem. Can you help me? What ideas do you have? So now as the teen, would you put some ideas in there? We could use alarm clocks. I'm gonna copy some of them. Timers, create a schedule. Um, write out the routine, um, a checklist. We could get up earlier, um, get ready the night before, set out our backpacks and whatnot. Uh, meal prep for breakfast and maybe lunch for the next day too. Um, decide. Maybe talk about the first class. Is it impacting their desire to go to school? Oh, discuss possible reasons for school avoidance. Maybe that's what's going on here. Okay. So in the interest of time, yeah, I could invite them. Okay. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna say we developed a lot of um, possibilities here, we did. And now I wanna go back with us. Thanks, Rachel, I see that message, I got seven minutes. Okay, um, I wanna talk about, and this activity is called solutions versus consequences. So we started out with consequences, which are often thinly disguised punishment. And um, I'll talk about more about punishment in just a minute, but right now I wanna focus on solutions. Solutions, are related to the problem, they're respectful to everyone, they're reasonable, meaning we think we can do it, and they're helpful in solving the problem. So when I do this with parents and I have more time, I always end up throwing things on this list that would be um, considered kind of ridiculous, unreasonable, or disrespectful to one or the other of us. And so then I'm gonna go through and say, okay, is there anything here, child, that you see as as not related to the idea of getting to school on time? If so, we're gonna cross it off the list. Is there anything here that's not respectful to you or anything I think is not respectful to me? So like the, if we had taking you to school in your pajamas thing, we'd cross that off because that would be disrespectful to you. If we'd say something like, mom has to make breakfast and lunch for everybody, um, kids don't have to help, 
I would consider that disrespectful to me. So we're going to cross off anything that would be disrespectful to either one of us. We're going to cross off anything that seems unreasonable. I, I just don't think we can pull that off. And we're going to cross anything, cross out anything that's not helpful in solving the problem of being late. And then once we've decided, okay, we've crossed out certain things, these are our choices, what should we try first? We might, and I like to write. I like to write things on a sticky note. So when we brainstorm ideas, if we put each idea on a sticky note, then when we've crossed them out, so to speak, we can just take that sticky note and put it over here. We're not considering that. But of the sticky notes that are left, we can stick them together. We can combine two or three ideas. Okay, here's what we're gonna try. Maybe we're going to use an alarm clock. We're gonna get up earlier and we're gonna do some of that preparation the day before. We're gonna set out the checklist and the routine. So we might combine several of them Let's write out our plan. Let's decide how long we're gonna try that for. So let's try it out for a week. Today's date is this, on, on Friday, we're gonna check in and see how our week went, see what we notice. Um, and it, uh, this is the date and the timer that we're gonna meet. We're gonna set the timer for 15 minutes because I don't want this to go on so long that I get eye rolling and are we done yet? And how long did, right? So I want to set a timer. We're going to only talk about this for 15 minutes. If we can't solve the problem in 15 minutes, we'll come back to it later. But we are going to solve the problem. And so now we're going to follow up on our plan and we're going to check back in a few days. Maybe it's working great and we keep going. We keep, this is our plan. It works. Hooray. Maybe it's like, oh, that part didn't work at all. So we're going to have to go back to the drawing board and say, okay, how, this part didn't work. What do we want to do about that? So now we might do some more brainstorming and then we'll use the three R's and the H to cross out anything that's not three R's and the H. And then based on that, we'll adjust our plan. And so a lot of times parents say, well, that takes a lot of time and it does. And then I would ask, okay, so how much time are you spending yelling and punishing and, and uh, getting mad at and, and, you know, trying all these things that weren't working for you? Sometimes we come up with the right solution right away. How many of you have had an experience in your life where you thought about a problem, you figured it out, your solution worked right away? And I can't see you, but maybe you can raise your hand. How many of you have thought you had the solution and you tried it and it didn't work? Do you take your cell phone away for the day? Do you deny yourself dinner? You have to go to bed without supper? Um, do you stop from seeing your friends for a week? or deny yourself the use of technology? Probably not. You probably <laughs> go back to the drawing board and figure out another possible solution. And so as we do this with our kids, I would ask you, if you see a life skill or character trait that our kids are practicing through this process, put it in the chat. And I'm going to go just a couple minutes over, but I'm almost done. Thanks, Rachel. What are some skills and character traits you got to practice as the child through this process? I see confidence, problem solving, being responsible, feeling your feelings. Oh, that's a good one. Responsibility, organization, decision making, assessing. Connection, yeah. Probably a whole lot of them. And so, yeah, coping and taking ownership with less anger to the parent, respect for self and others. And so to the question that was, was given earlier, um, I would invite those parents, um, and, and I don't know if you're in a therapeutic system, um, setting or, or if you're able to work with the parents and the child together, or even just teaching parents the skill to say, hey, we need to talk. I'm feeling like you've got all the power and I don't have any, and, and I feel worried and I feel concerned and disrespected. I wonder if we can work this out and brainstorm some possibilities about how you and my child can have power and how we can have a respectful relationship with each other. Um, how If I'm afraid for you, can you give me any sense of confidence or, or reassurance that you're okay because I love you and I'm worried? And when we start the conversation there, again, short times, 15 minutes, I promise, and then we'll stop. I just need to, to learn more about what could we possibly do 
and use this process for figuring it out. Um, so I want to add just a little bit. When we focus on punishment, what skills are our kids learning? I want you to think back to a time when you have been punished or made to pay for something that you did. And you're looking backward at that mistake through this process of being punished. How did you feel? There are some R words that are typically associated with punishment. Some of those R words are resentful, revenge, retaliation, yeah, retreat. Are those skills we want our kids to practice? And punishment makes us look backwards at the mistake. <clears throat> and I don't know if you've ever tried to walk forward while you're looking backward. It's really hard to do and you and you get all wonky and you're walking or maybe you've been walking down a hallway or down the mall or, or somewhere on the street and somebody's walking toward you but they're looking backward and you're really trying to dodge them because you're about to bump into them, right? We can't look forward if we're looking backward. Solutions help us look forward. The mistake happened. Let's make amends. If we broke something, let's fix it. Maybe we need to pay for it. Whatever it is that happened, how do we make amends? And then how do we talk about a solution that will help us moving forward so that we are less likely to make that mistake again? And so helping us move forward through solutions is something that we focus on a lot. And a lot, that can be a really big paradigm shift for people because we've been raised to be here, we've been raised to believe in the power of punishment and rewards, which are often effective in the small picture, in the moment, they can be effective. And then they can also, in the big picture, cause a lot of problems. So if you aren't familiar with it, I really recommend the book, um, I can't see my chat, let me type it in there. It's called Punished by Rewards by Alfie Cohen. I think he's a K cone, not a C cone. Um, okay, thanks, Rachel, I see. So uh, Punished by Rewards it helps us see that rewards also seem to be working in the moment. And yet, when we reward, 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 eventually we get kids who say, oh yeah, what's in it for me? What are you gonna give me? Ah, that's not good enough, I want that. And all of the motivation comes from outside, not from inside. We want to help them develop an internal locus of control, not an external one, okay? And the punishment is the same way. It's coming from the outside. We're not developing that internal sense of what's right and wrong and integrity and honesty and all those skills that we want them to have from here. It's all coming from here. So small picture, okay. Yeah, they can be effective. Big picture whew, can really cause us some problems. So I want to leave you with some vision. I want you to imagine a world in which positive discipline became just what we do in families, classrooms, and relationships. This is how we think. This is what we do. Human beings of all ages who have these skills over here on the left, parents who feel competent and confident and experience joy in creating a connected family, teachers who get to spend more time teaching and less time managing challenging behaviors and actually enjoy working with students. So I want to give you some information about things that are available to you. Um, teaching parenting the positive discipline way is, um, a certification training through positive discipline. It's a four, all of these are about 14 hour trainings and teaching parenting the positive discipline way is going to certify you to facilitate parenting classes. So if you want someone at your organization to be able to teach positive discipline parenting to your parent community, you can take that certification training and I'll show you a really quick, I'm just gonna move this inside my little box here. If you go to the PDA website, positivediscipline.org, I'll put that there pretty soon, and you look up here at training, and you go to parent educator certification, it's going to, if you scroll down, share with you a whole lot of different possibilities. Some of these are online, some are in person. These are all in English. Here are some that are in Spanish. We're in 90 countries, so if you keep scrolling, you're gonna see Portuguese, French, Arabic, Dutch, Polish, lots of things there, um, but you can find those trainings there. I'm just wrapping up one, so I don't have a current one scheduled yet, but all of the trainers are going to put you in good shape. So I think you can pick any one of those that are available to you if you'd like to be certified or have someone at your organization um, 
be certified. Um, positive discipline in the classroom is a K-12 curriculum for teachers and positive discipline for early childhood educators is focused on um, parents, child, uh, childhood educators and caregivers for children ages zero to six. So probably up through about first grade. Um, <clears throat> I'm certified in the three that are highlighted. And so if you, for instance, have at least five people in your organization who would like to do either a short training just to get a taste of positive discipline, we'd we'd spend more time on each activity um, because we wouldn't be rushed for time. We'd plan the topics for the day. And there are lots and lots of different activities depending on the purpose and what you're hoping people will take from it. So I can help you create an agenda that's useful to your audience. So if you want shorter trainings just to introduce the ideas, we can do that. If you want the full 14 hour certification, um, as long as you have at least five people, I can put together a private training for your organization only and, and we can do it that way. Or if you decide to be the sponsoring organization and you've got these five people who are guaranteed to come, then if you want to, we can open it up to the general public, but we don't have to. Um, what I do, um, my website is evadwhite.com. My email and my phone are here. You can text, call, email if you have questions about anything. You can find me on social media. Services I offer, I offer those certification workshops. Um, I offer classes for parents of teens and tweens. And Debbie, if you have a chance now, would you be able to load those other handouts? I just did. It. You just did. Thank you. So the things that Debbie just loaded are the a list of workshops that I already offer for parents of teens and tweens and some class descriptions for that. If that appeals for you, you can say, oh, I want all 10 of these, or I want this one, that one, and the other one, or I want something around this topic. What could you do? And I can create a, an agenda, again, based on what you would like parents to walk away with. I can do that for teachers too. Um, so classes for parents of teens and tweens is my, my specialty. I'm certified for all ages. Um, but my classes typically are focused on the teen and tween range. Um, professional development for teachers of all ages, pre-K through 12. Um, online classes for parents of teens and tweens is a new venture for me. Um, it's called Navigating the Teen Years, and it's for parents who just would like to learn on their own. They don't want to be committed to a class. They don't want to have to, um, to show up or or you know, whatever. There are lots of reasons people want to be able to do things just independently. So I currently have seven classes loaded. There will be eventually 10. I have a goal of getting those done by, by the end of March so that right now there's a good place for them to start and I'll have the others loaded soon. So with that, and I just also wanted to point out that the Positive Discipline Association 2024 conference is July uh, 12, 13, 14 in Atlanta. I'm sorry, it's July 12th in Atlanta. Um, we have two days after that for just people who have completed a certification workshop called Think Tank. But the conference is open to the general public. If you would like to go to Atlanta and join us in July, um, you can register at positivediscipline.org. And um, what is the cost of my classes? So these certification training prices are set by the Positive Discipline Association. So the certification workshops are um, if you pay early bird pricing, and if you're organizing your own group, I would give you early bird pricing of $4.49 per person, which covers the materials. You get the positive discipline book, the manual that goes with, with whatever training it is, and a set of the, the tool cards that are available. So we have, I don't have my tool cards out, but um, there's 52 parenting tools, one tool for every week of the year to practice. So there's a deck of those, and there's another one for early childhood, and another one for in the classroom. So the materials are included and all participants receive one free year's membership in the Positive Discipline Association. And so 449 is the early bird price, 499 tends to be the regular bird price, um, but I would give you the early bird if you're organizing it through your, your business or school. Um, and then if you, if you have a lot of people, at some point it becomes more cost effective to pay me a daily rate rather than the per person rate. And then you pay me a daily rate um, for my services and then purchase the material separately. And I have a trainer discount that I can offer you so that it costs less this way. So if that's something you're interested in, please email me, give me a call, text me, whatever, and let's get together and talk. For my own, for like the individualized parenting workshops or individualized small 90 minutes or so, up to two hours is probably a good time. Um, for teachers and parents, those I charge $200 an hour for my services there. And um, again, if we have five people that are able to come, 
you can pay me and make it free to your parent community. You can decide to charge. It's totally up to you. But if any of this is interesting to you and you'd like to learn more, no pressure, just information. Feel free to contact me and let's talk about possibilities because uh, this work is my passion. I retired from the school system in 2018 so that I could do more of this work. Um, I believe, I know it's life-changing because it's changed my life. And I have so many other people that I've worked with who say this changed my life too. I think it's world changing. And so um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to offer it whenever I have the opportunity to talk. So I'm here to take questions if we have more questions. Um, and I just really appreciate everybody's time today. Thank you for um, your commitment to kids in whatever capacity you're working with them as a parent, as an educator, as a social worker, counselor, whatever you do, you help make the world a better place. And thank you for that. So I'll take questions. It looks like we have about nine minutes. I went, it was like, sometimes it's like drinking from a fire hose. Like I'm squirting you with a lot of information. When we do these classes and certifications, I don't come at you that fast. We just really slow it down and people get time to process and think and have discussion. And again, it's a lot more interactive. Oh, and any of these I can deliver either in person or online. It's effective both ways. So just keep that in mind as well. Eva, you are a wonderful speaker and I love the information is so wonderful. Every time I listen to you speak, I get one extra nugget. And I have a question. Okay. While other people might be putting in other, oh, let's let's address this one. Did I miss where the online self-paced class is? Is there a self-paced class? Yeah, the self-paced class is the one that Debbie put in the chat. And we'll send this to you again afterward. The one that's called Eva Dwight Navigating the Teen Years. Mm. Um, it's on a platform called teachable.com. And so I'll put the link to it in the chat. You can just go to Eva, oh, hang on, Eva Dwight's classes.teachable.com. And just so you know, the first one is free. So you can refer it to parents and they can try it. And it's like, eh, that's not for me. That's okay. They didn't pay for anything. It was totally free. Every, every module has a video session that's either somewhere between 15 and 25 minutes long of me teaching kind of like webinar style. I'm doing the role plays and processing, but giving people opportunities to think, feel, decide, even though I can't talk to them. And so each module has um, a 15 to 25 minute video for the learning, a reflection sheet to guide their thinking as they process the information and decide how they want to apply it. <clears throat> and then there's an invitation to email me with questions or what do I do about this particular situation or oh, something worked, send me a success story. Um, and then also, especially for people who need a certificate of participation, maybe they've been referred um, through the Department of Child Services or something and they have to have parenting classes, they can um, send me an application for a certificate of participation. I'll send each module, they could earn one hour certificate and and they have to answer some questions to to hold them accountable for saying okay I know you watch the video I know you're doing some thinking here so there's some accountability brought in there so you can go explore that see what you think and I'd be happy with feedback because like I said it's a new venture for me and I'm just trying to find new ways to meet people's needs and um, a lot of people seem to want to be able to listen to this as you walk the dog or you drive around town or on your lunch break or whatever so that's what it's designed for any other questions? Well, I always have questions. Um, Ask me. What, what would you say is the most common nugget that people leave with? Like what is like when you think of positive discipline? Hmm. I think somebody put it in the chat earlier. It was about self-awareness. It doesn't take very long for people to say, oh, this is about me. <laughs> This is about how I change who I'm being with my child. It's not about fixing my kid. And, and we, we don't, I don't have to lecture you for you to get that. It comes through because of the interactive and experiential nature of the activities. And so a lot of times I have parents coming in saying, I need to know how to fix my kid. And then they walk away saying, oh, I gotta fix myself. <laughs> and so I think that, and that's, that's my realization too. And you know what helps me because like I said, even with my adult kids, if I forget to use my skills, man, I know it pretty quickly based on the response I'm getting from them. The fact that I get to teach this work regularly keeps it front and center for me a lot. And yet, if you had a class, and now it's been months since you had a class, we revert to 
muscle memory, right? What's been ingrained in our system since we were born? What's that paradigm, that, that private logic that we're using, the lens that we're seeing through the world? That comes back pretty quickly. So a lot of times we need some regular infusions of who do I want to be? Oh, can I tell them two more books? Okay, there's the original Positive Discipline book. There's the Positive Discipline for Teenagers. And I tell people this was absolutely my parenting Bible through these teen years is that I could open this book and just start reading when I'm feeling eh about my kid or a particular student I was working with. And I can start reading and say, okay, I know who I need to be. I have an idea of what I want to do. It just gets me back in that place. And then... For those of you who might work in the school system, Positive Discipline in the Classroom is the book that outlines all of these ideas and shares a lot of specific examples of teachers who are using the curriculum in their classroom and the huge difference they have noticed in how smoothly their classroom runs, how connected their students are to each other, how much more efficiently they're able to teach their curriculum. So it's powerful stuff. And you can go to the .com website, positivediscipline.com, and look for resources to see what book titles you like and then if you want to go to Amazon and get an audible copy so you can listen or a used copy, whatever, and there, there are lots of, of them available through various sources. So, sorry, I'll shut up. Any other questions? Oh, the, the books are incredible. They're they are. wonderful. <clears throat> and I would recommend the training as well. I went through the training and I thought it was fabulous, not only for my kids and my clients, but for myself and my, uh, my adult relationships, mm -hmm. wonderful communication. <clears throat> so. Right. Are there any talks of books specific to those with developmental disabilities or neurodivergence? Yes, there is a positive discipline with for children with special needs. Um, and so that one really helps parents regard, I mean, because they can't address every single special need, right? So it speaks in more general terms to the same idea of the two lists. And yet, because of your child's needs, they may not go from A to B as quickly as a typical child. So for your child, what's the goal? It, for your child, what are some baby steps you could help them use to get to what their version of the goal is gonna look like based on who they are and what their capabilities and needs are? So I think that's really helpful. Um, there's also positive discipline for the single parent, positive discipline um, for uh, parents in recovery, so if you go on the .com website, the .org site is the nonprofit, and we handle a lot of the, the theory, the training, um, the, the conference, all of that goes through there. The .com has a newsletter and other materials and resources, especially books, tool cards, so you can go to both sites and explore to see what you can find that would be useful, because there's a topic, there's so many different topics based on the need. Positive discipline in the first three years, my son and daughter-in-law, let me give that to them. Um, positive discipline for preschoolers. So there's a lot. All right. Wonderful. Kevin, I'm glad you found that. Thanks. This has just been phenomenal. Um, I so wish I had it when my kids were not adults, but my hmm. youngest adult daughter still lives at home and she is never on time for work. Like, <laughs> and it stresses me out. And it's like, I was like, really, I'm going to go back and rewatch that part because I always like, I know she's an adult and it's her job, but she just, I'm like, why, why? So thank you for the information. Hopefully that will help. And, and I'll speak to that too, Debbie, is that um, when I first started using this 27 years ago, you know, I read the book, my husband and I are, are kind of doing it. We're understanding at a really sur superficial level. And so there were mistakes that I made that was like, oh, I didn't quite get that aspect of it. You know, here are the mistakes I made along the way because I didn't understand. And then over time, I, I became a parent educator in 2008. I took that teaching parenting certification workshop. So starting in 2008, I started offering parenting classes through my school and I still do through Mesa Public Schools Parent University. And then I took the classroom certification. I was already out of the classroom. I was in the counseling office by then, but I was able to use those tools with the kids in the 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 way that I was working with them and, and help teachers use some of those um, tools and skills as well. And so in 2018, I went through the process, which is quite long, of becoming a trainer. And then my, my understanding deepened. And now I'm involved in the, the NASAP organization, which is focused on Adlerian psychology. And my, my, my learning continues to deepen. And my skills continue to grow, my awareness and understanding. So this is this is stuff that you can start out with small bites and you can just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger depending on 
what you want to learn. I love it. I absolutely love it. Mm -hmm. um, I hope all of you loved it as well. Uh, there's just a little QR code there. If you'd like to, you can hop on and leave us a little review. I will be sending out CEU certificates as well as the four handouts um, and uh, the parts of the presentation that aren't proprietary. I'll be hopefully getting that out to everyone this afternoon. Um, again, this was just really interesting and informative and just kind of fascinating. And you are just a phenomenal speaker. So oh, thank you. Thank you so much for taking your time um, doing all of this for us. I'm going to stop.